David is a distinguished professor in the English department and MFA program in creative writing at the University of Wyoming. Um, and when we first said we're going to do a food themed Saturday University, I, David, I want you to know I, Peter Perelin, said we have got to have David Romfett on board because he will be invaluable. David got his BA in American Studies from Reed College with an emphasis in history and literature. He got his MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop Poetry Program. At Iowa, he worked in the International Translation Workshop. He's been a grad fellow of the University of Texas Ethnomusicology and Folklore Program. In Wyoming, he has been our Poet Laureate. His many volumes of poetry include Some Church and a Flower Whose Name I Do Not Know. Uh, he is an accordion player in Northern Wyoming's Fire Ants. Um, he's got his, his, he defines his major interests as in syncretic phenomena in culture, meaning bringing together aspects of culture that don't necessarily start off together, but come together and influence each other. As one example, what happens um, in our history when Europe and a America and Africa collide, coincide. Um, in the fall of 2013, David is going to teach a course at UW in the Basque language. It is the first time in UW's history that we're offering a course in Basque. We're only the fourth university in North America that offers a course in Basque. Um, David's talk, performance today is going to our collective performance, I think, is called Inseparable Ingredients, Food and Music. David Romfeld. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here, and I'm really, really happy to be here, too. I would thank everyone, but we've already done all that. They know they're thanked, and we're grateful, right? We've got that. So if you see them, you thank them, too. You can see there's some foods out here today. We're going to make a food. What food are we going to make? Guacamole. We're going to make guacamole. It does come from Nahua, you know the language of the Aztecs. All the words, if you're interested in Spanish, that end in ote, like guacolote, tecolote, those kind of words, they all come from Nahua originally. So they're, they're local words of the Americas. They're not in the Spanish of the Iberian Peninsula. They're American words. And they're all mispronunciations because Spaniards tried to get close but couldn't pronounce. There's a kind of a, kind of like a glottal stop click in that language, where a word like uh, tecolote should be tecolo, that kind of sound. Uh, but the Spaniards just said, well, forget that old, old thing. <laughs> We're just going to say ote. <laughs> uh, so they did that. So guajalote comes from the word for, uh, does anybody know the word for avocado in Spanish? Another Nahuatl word. No? Uh, it's aguacate. Aguacate. So you can hear that cate word is in there. And then uh, mole, you all know what a mole is? It is a sauce. There are millions of moles. So guacamole, sauce of guaca, right, is a nice thing to do. But it couldn't exist until the arrival of Old World. We call it Old World, right? It's a really weird idea that Europe is the Old World and America is the New World, like we went to the moon, which I'm sure <laughs> for the Spaniards it sort of was. And they tried to build an entire universe based on their own ignorance, right? You all know this confusion that when Columbus first arrived, he was looking for what? Indies. He was looking for the East Indies, right? So we now have a term, the West Indies, and we still use it over 500 years later. But he didn't get where he wanted to go. What was he looking for when he went there? Is Spice. it Spices. He was looking for spices. And there was one in particular that people were very interested in that wasn't known in Europe and had to be imported that had a bit of a bite. What is that? Pepper. Pepper. What do you call a green thing that looks sort of like this often in English? Well, yes, but that's not an English word. <laughs> a pepper, right? There's a red one and a yellow one and a green one. They're long skinny ones. They're little funny crumpled ones. They're black ones. There are all kinds of them. We use the word pepper because of the blundering stupidity of Christopher Columbus and his compatriots, right? And why did he call them pepper? He got sent here to find pepper. He didn't find pepper. What did he take back to Spain? Pepper. But he didn't find it. So now we have this confusion. This is not pepper. What is the family this is in? Does anybody know its general name? 
the, well, we call them chilies. That's the word, because that also is a Nahuatl word, the chilioi kind of word. I can't even remember it exactly, but it's close to what we say is chile. But this family that all peppers are in, anybody know it? Oh, yes, that's right. So I'm sorry, I'm probably using the wrong, where's Rhoda? Rhoda, are you here? I'm probably using the wrong scientific nomenclature. It's probably not family, right? I forget. I just use family in a general, like my family. Here it is, one member. <laughs> capsicum. It's capsicum is all the peppers. And capsicum is an American food. Now, before we go any further with that, I have to take my shirt off because we're going to do some things. And I want to tell you two little jokes, and we'll move on to the next part of today's presentation for here. How about this joke? Can you read it? Let's eat, Grandma. Let's eat, Grandma. <laughs> and commas save lives. So it's a food, it's a linguistic food joke about cannibalism and English 1010 at the university. Um, and the second joke I want to tell is when Columbus came, he was stunned. You know, he landed on what they called Hispaniola which is the island that includes two countries bitterly divided historically with incredible difficulties between each other politically and socially. That's Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And when he landed there, he was shocked at the profusion of plants, animals, things he had never seen before in his entire life, never had any background for. And he wrote a lot about it, including the discovery of large lizards that the local people ate that lizard that we often call now an iguana. And Columbus tried iguana. Do you know what he wrote in his journal? I think it's a, yes, he actually wrote that in his journal. He wrote, well, we had this thing they have there, and it's pretty good, and it tastes a lot like chicken. I thought, are you kidding me? This is a 500 and some year old joke about every weird foreign meat food that you eat tastes like chicken. So those are my two jokes for right now. We need volunteers. Does anybody want to be on the cooking crew? Well, come over here, Peter. You get to, because you want to, too. And you were begging early on, right? And let's see. We got three cutting boards. Oh, and we need fire management. OK. I also want to do something with the music. We said in the introduction that music and food were inseparable. So we've now started a little bit with Columbus. We're going to talk about that some more. We know about capsicum that he discovered, thinking he'd bring it back and claim it was pepper and hope for the best when he asked for more money to go a second time. Uh, it is really interesting that that journey, do you know that the journey of Columbus's little tiny fleet of three ships that went down out of Spain, out of the Iberian Peninsula, was also the same tide, the same outgoing tide, carried the last uh, exiled Jews from Spain. You all know that when Ferdinand and Isabella came to power, one of their big agendas was the unification of the Iberian Peninsula into a nation, as we might understand it. And that meant the ejection of Jews, Roma people, Basque people were all like, you were forbidden. So you had options. You had options to sign up with the divine crown of Ferdinand and Isabella to leave the country, or if you wish to be a martyr, to die for your values at that time. That was it. So the, the ships carrying Columbus carried the last Jews out of Spain at the same time. A very interesting feature, which I want to mention. How many people, does anybody know what the estimates are for the population of the Central Valley of Mexico and Mesoamerica at the time Columbus arrived? Do you have guesses about how many people they think might have lived there? This changes over time a lot. When I was a kid, we were taught very different things. Say again? Nice guess. Anybody else? Do you think he's right? That's good. You think it's more? Do you have a reason? It just feels like that's too low. Anybody? S yes? So, so I think what you're getting at is, is that the Spaniards annihilated a lot of We're going to get there pretty soon. <laughs> so I'm going to guess about five and a half million. Five and a half million. One more guess. 10 million, she's really, we're going. This well, is like, wait, wait, digging. don't tell me. You're digging. 25 million. 25, wow. I, I was gonna say. 25 million in 1520 when Hernán Cortés landed, right, at Veracruz. And by 1580, 60 years later, that population is approximately 6 to 7 million. And by 1605, 
85 years, or what's that, 86 years after the landing, 1 million. So we have seen a population decline due to, in some places, famine because of changing social disease, diseases that were brought, although the American peoples did offer us a great disease back in return. Do we all know what that is? Yeah, the one called French disease, syphilis, came back to us. Um, I don't know who got the best deal on that. Uh, but the interesting thing for me is that there is this horrifying social history around the encounter of Europe with the Americas in its beginning. But that also gave rise to incredibly beautiful things that never existed before that meeting, if we can call it a meeting. And guacamole is one of those, because almost everything you see here, what have we got? Uh, let's see, who makes guacamole at home? Everybody makes guacamole. We're Americans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, how do you make guacamole? Can you describe it briefly? Go. Lime juice. Jalapenos. Jalapenos. Uh, garlic tomatoes. Maybe seasoning. Little onion. Salt, pepper. Salt, pepper. Lime juice. Garlic. Yes. Garlic. Yeah. Garlic. 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 Yeah. So let's see. Let's get the cooking crew. And we need chopped tomatoes, we need chopped jalapeno, we need chopped garlic. You're the cooks, you decide how much. We need limes. This is the most depressing fact of modern life, right here. I, when I get these home, does anybody do this? I take the sticker off before I'll put it anywhere in my house. I have to go through and take stickers. Now they even put stickers on, I don't know, just about everything. The tiniest little thing. And my clerks in the grocery store often don't know what they're ringing up. Does that make sense to you? They pass this by the screen, and sometimes maybe it got the wrong, maybe a label fell off one thing in the store and landed on another thing, and the avocado goes by and it says eggplant on the screen, you know, and then they have to ask me, what's going on here? Fantastic. This is for trash. That's your compost buckets. We also need a fire management person. Is there anybody who wants to do fire? Who likes fire? Yeah, Paul? So what we're going to do is we're going to have a fire. I would suggest you might want to go around on the cement over there. Okay. And we've got a little thing here and that. Where's olive oil come from? <laughs> I really like that. Where's olive oil come from? Olives. Oh, yeah. Well, two little interesting food facts about the transformation of food because of social realities. I hope you're okay with how we're kind of floating around on subjects. They will cohere, I promise you. Uh, one is Solon. Have you ever heard the name Solon? Anybody? John. Greek, Greek, Greek uh, jurist. Greek jurist. Okay. It's a small town in North Dakota. There you go. Also in <laughs> Iowa. Na because in the old days, we used to care about things like that. Now we name our towns things like Margaritaville. But, <laughs> Uh, yes, and Solon, who as a Greek leader in the Greek city-state period, about the 7th century before the Common Era, with the council then, made a decree that had major impact on food. And that was the decree that no foods grown in Greece could be exported except olive oil. There had already been something really disastrous happen. You all know that Greece is mostly over limestone doesn't drain so well. It was forested, but the early Greeks, with hills and tiny valleys, chopped down trees pretty early, uh, both for firewood, for building, and for clearing land, the small amount of land they had for growing crops. But when they took those trees out, basically, they destroyed the ability of that limestone underpinning soil to hold on to itself. So you got massive washing of soil down, away, and the land changed dramatically. Then Solon announced the only food crop, because Greece struggled, you know, Greece was kind of imperial early on, based on its navy, and it was required to import a lot of its food earlier than we might think. Could you be quieter over there? Um, no, I'm joking, keep crunching away. Let's see how he's you doing that. You want garlic in this guacamole? Wait a minute. Does anybody know how to really deal with garlic? Come on. Yes. Everybody, take the garlic, put your knife over it, and go. <laughs> and then the skin will come all off. You're a cook. <laughs> uh, so Solon said nothing but export of olive. Well, how does olive trees grow? Does anybody know in terms of their root system? 
Yes. It's problematic. What's going to be a problematic root system in Greek limestone underpin what? Uh, no, the opposite. It's a taproot plant. With long taproot plant, which means it's going down there, but it is not like a plant that's got filamentous root system really holding soil. It's not helping us very much that way. So that introduction of exporting olives from Greece in the seventh century before Christ was born, a long time ago in Western history, is a major transformation of food on that lower peninsula and in the entire region. A second one that's really interesting to me, um, do you know why the turkey is called turkey in English? Anybody? No, because the original traders, when it came back, you know turkey's an American cr thing? Does everybody know that? Turkey didn't exist in Europe. Turkey was brought to Europe after the Americas were reached by Europeans. And it came back through traders in what country? Turkey. Turkey. So the Europeans who got it in the north of the Mediterranean called them turkeys. They came from Turkey. And there are a lot of animals like that. Anybody else know, or do you know other foods that are American, that came from the Americas that are super common? We got these. Corn. Really important. Capsicum peppers, tomatoes, corn, avocados. What else is American? Potatoes, squash, anything else? Foods that are super important in the diets of Europeans and even Africans in many cases, and often people don't even know necessarily that they didn't exist. There's this idea, you know, one of the things John talked about, what is a cuisine, and he put that thing up from, what's the guy's name, Mintz? Um, who, who had that quote about what he understood a cuisine to be. And so this whole idea of a cuisine having to do with where the food's coming from and how you get these foods is so super important, I think. We don't, for example, believe, most people, that there were cuisines as we understand them in the national sense. John poo pooed national cuisine in his talk a little bit. But then he also said cuisine can be based on a place, but maybe nation's too big, or we're not certain how the idea of national cuisine works. But the argument is that there was nothing in medieval Europe that we can identify as French cuisine, Italian cuisine, Iberian cuisine. It doesn't exist. If you read the earliest cookbooks, there are some cookbooks from the 14th century. You will find in those cookbooks things that are really similar, whether it was happening in Great Britain or France or Spain or Italy, that foods came to these peoples from the Americas and transformed their notion of the foods they ate and developed in different places, often according to at what point in history a given people accepted a new food. What was wrong with tomatoes? They're poison. They're poison. Anybody knows that, right? My wife's grandfather was told not to eat tomatoes when they came from Russia. They were German Russians. And they came not from Ukraine, but from down farther south in the Stans. This is in the 20th century. Do not eat tomatoes. Let's go back now. What are other American foods? Cocoa. Cocoa. Chocolate. Where does the word chocolate come from? Come on, we know. We know about these Aztecs, right? It's a Nahua word. Chocolate. Right? And we got chocolate in Spanish, and then we got chocolate. We got cocoa. That's a really dumb word because it's all mixed up. It's like we got a bunch of food words where there are confusions about what they are. There's a special potato we have here that's an American one that also existed a kind of cousin species in Asia. Sweet potatoes and yams. But we don't really have yams. We don't sell yams. If you go in that Albertsons over there, no, it's over there, I'll bet you that you'll find a bin that says yams. They're sweet potatoes. There are a lot of different kinds of sweet potatoes, too, with slightly different colors and shapes and skin textures and all of that. So it's really interesting, this confusion. There's so many foods. There's another really big starch food, massively important in African. Cassava. Yeah, cassava, also known as yuca, also known as manioc, mangioki, is tapioca. I can't tell you how many times I wish to throw the tapioca pudding out the window. <laughs> but my mother made me eat tapioca pudding. It's like, mama, they're little eyeballs. <laughs> you know, pearl tapioca, which is a processing for manioc, right? 
But manioc, super important. We don't associate, I don't think, or do some of you associate manioc as an American food? No, but it is from here, from this con these continents, the Americas. It went back to Africa. I started to tell you about a couple of things. One was the importation of turkeys through Turkey. One was the uh, chicken joke. There's another interesting social phenomena that change how people eat. Can you think of some other major food crops? Something that's in, if you get a packaged food now, there's some things that is in every packaged food. Can you name some of them? There's usually high fructose corn syrup of some kind. Now, I'll tell you one thing. Like Rhoda said, you don't know my opinion. And John said, well, I'm trying not to give it away. Do not eat high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> I saw Jack LaLanne in his 90s wearing a spandex suit on a TV talk show. In his 90s. He got down on the floor and said, want to see me give you 25? You know, it's like, Jack, you're 90-something. Why are you so healthy? Because I never ate anything that came in a package. This is from the guy who invented power bars, by the way, too. That <laughs> Came in but he said that, don't eat it if it's in a package. So in the package, we know there's high fructose corn syrup. Interesting, we know that. What else is often in those packages? Salt. Salt. Yeah, various preservatives of some kind with long string names that only chemists know. Hydrogenized, Hydrogenized oil of some kind. Hydrogenated, I think they call it, right? Hyd Hydrogenated, yeah. Oh, some kind of palm oil. That's a good one, too, palm oil. The heart of Bahian cuisine is palm oil, but we're told we can't eat it. You go to Bahia, go out on the streets and look at people. Do they look unhealthy? There are a lot of people. They're living something different in their life than ours. Pardon me? Oh, sorry, Bahia, northeastern Brazil. And, of course, northeastern Brazil is the closest point. I'm getting back to a point about the packaged foods. The closest point to the, big bulge, the two big bulges, Africa and South America. And that crossing was central to what in our social history? What was one of the biggest trade items? Slaves. Slaves, human beings. And in that trade route going back and forth was also manioc, because manioc was a staple food on slave ships. Uh, the, it's interesting that the slave ships used manioc pounded. Have you ever heard the term fufu? This is a food pounded from manioc. It's super common in West Africa. And uh, you make a kind of a pasty thing, and you can beat it to death and turn it into this gooey, spongy blob and wrap it in a banana leaf and take it to work for lunch. Don't ask me. I'm an American. Fufu is the most awful food I've ever eaten. But people live on fufu. So the slave ships are carrying manioc as a staple item back and forth. And manioc ends up being now thought of as a West African food, not so much an American one. But in the Americas, we still see it. When you uh, go in a little restaurant like a to have pizza or something. Are you okay with how I'm talking to you today? I mean, it's not too wide-ranging and weird for you. It's like kind of like this. But what I'm trying to talk about is the Americas and what we call the Old World and their food interactions. So we know all these foods went back to Europe, became very important. So uh, where am I? Mania. So when you go in a little pizza hall and you often see there's like a thing of that, that stuff they claim is Parmesan cheese. Uh, in the bottle, uh, or also a little thing of dried chilies, maybe from some kind of red chili that also you can sprinkle on. If you are in Bahia, in northeastern Brazil, on every table there will be, with every meal, farofa. Anybody know what farofa is? It's like manioc, <laughs> dried and roasted in a dry pan, the way you would rice, and served as a little sprinkling like uh, sesame seeds ground up, and you sprinkle it on any food you want, farofa. Man, it's made from manioc. The ships that carried the sailors in that time period, these huge navies, Spain, England, Portugal, they didn't eat manioc. Do you know what their staple food was often on these ships? Which couldn't have existed until they got to America, so the rise of these navies is to some degree dependent upon this food transformation. Anybody take a guess? Where do potatoes come from? Generally, the Andes region. Andean peoples, right? There was no Peru, but OK, somehow there. And there are millions of varieties of potatoes. How did the Andean peoples preserve and use potatoes? Do you know? They dried it? They froze dried it. They froze dried it? That's a weird phrase. They freeze dried it. Can you describe the process at all? They put them out. And then they left them to dry several days in the cold. They let them freeze at night. 
Then everybody went out together and had a big potato smashing party. They like grapes in the Lucille Ball episode, which maybe you didn't see because you're not old. But uh, they smashed potatoes and then they left them again, let them freeze again, smashed them again, let them freeze. So every time, you all know that American Indians did this with maple syrup too, right? Instead of boiling, they didn't have these huge fires like we would have in New England now. They would actually freeze the sap and let it evaporate out. It took a lot longer, but you could get maple kind of a consistency, more like maple syrup through freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing. So the Andean peoples did that with potatoes and ended up with a kind of uh, beef jerky kind of thing made of potato, a dry, hard, you could travel with it. It was light. It took all the liquid out of it, right? That's what was eaten on British Navy ships. So what's wrong with the potato being the only thing? Uh, <coughs> What's wrong with the potato being the only thing on the Navy ships? Oh, uh, vitamin C. Yeah, we have these diseases we've heard about, and nobody quite knew why you got these illnesses, but they knew what stopped them. The British Navy knew long before they stopped it how to stop scurvy on their ships, but why didn't they do it? No refrigerator. You don't have to refrigerate your lemons and limes. It's cool enough on the ship. They're going to last a long time. Aha! We don't want to spend the money. Limes are expensive. Lemons are expensive. Limes were cheaper. They shifted to limes because they cost less. They were lemons at first. Okay. Limes have less vitamin C per volume than lemons. Or the limes they had access to, which were not the true lime, what we know is the key lime. Right? You all know that term, the key lime. The limes we buy in the grocery aren't limes. They're lemons that are green. Does that make sense? So that, for example, in, in Mexican Spanish, that green thing is not called a lima. There is a thing called a lima. That's not a lima. That's a limon. Right, which to us is like, why do you call the green one a limon? Isn't that a lemon? No, that's a limon. It's another one of these term things that is confusing when it crosses languages. What else is American food that went away to Europe? Now we got manioc too. Anything left? Are you doing all right over there? So the next thing is to get the fire going and saute the garlic and the jalapenos. Can you do that, sure. Paul? And there's a little stir. You're cooking. Oh, sure. Those are American foods that didn't go to Europe with the early settlers. They're rediscoveries that we've made in modern times, often because of our industrial food processing and a desire for health food. There are some weird issues surrounding how quinoa came to North America when it didn't go with the original Colombian kind of exploration back to Europe very much. It didn't become a big part of diet. There are a lot of foods like that that now we're rediscovering in, non, in the non-native place of the food. Does that make sense? No. Capsicum is new world. No capsicum in Europe in the medieval period. <laughs> now that's interesting. There are several foods, and chilies are one of them, that got to Asia, and then people think, well, time immemorial, chilies, how do you make Szechuan food without, you know, well, excuse me, there weren't any chilies until they came from the Americas. There's another one that's very widely used in Asian cooking that's American, also big time in Africa. Pineapple, uh, pineapple but not so big, although that's a fine answer. Anybody? What? Soy, no. No, no, no. Nobody, oh, no kid, if you have a table there, there'll be a table that says this is the uh, free table in the grade school. Peanut. Peanut's an American food that was shipped away. Now, interesting, you all may know that uh, Mexico was, of course, a part of the Spanish colonial empire. The Philippines also was, right? But the Philippines was administered by the viceroy in Mexico. So Mexican culture was transplanted to some degree across to the Philippines. The ships that carried goods had to go between Acapulco and Manila so that Philippine ships came back to Mexico, stuff was unloaded, shipped overland to Veracruz in eastern Mexico, you know, facing Cuba, and then shipped from there back to Spain. And then the same thing happened in reverse. So a number of foods went back and forth directly from Mexico into the Philippines without the intervening business of Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. That's pretty amazing. Hey, how much time do we have? Not enough. How much, what time is it? After it's 10 after, oh my lord. We have to hurry along. Quick question about what you want done with the avocados. 
It's guacamole! <laughs> I'm in Canada, I'm not an American. I don't make this stuff. Oh, that's why you call them avocados. Yeah. You cut them in half, you take them here. Yeah, help them, help them. Three African foods deeply a part of American, United Statesian, Southern cuisine. Associated so deeply with Southern American foods of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, that are all African and came here. This is all food-related stuff in the Caribbean. Actually, yes. I hadn't thought about it. Okra. What else? A uh, particular one. No, that's American, not African. Black-eyed peas. Black-eyed peas. We got okra. What else? Watermelon. Isn't that weird? Watermelon came here. That's really strange because a bunch of other melons were here and went back to Europe. It's very weird that the watermelon is an African crop originally. Okay, now I'm going to play you a tune that I didn't play in the beginning because I forgot. And I want to play it for you because it's a... This is a button accordion. Um, it is a tune from the Basque people, and we haven't talked at all about that cuisine, which is a huge cuisine, also to some degree dependent upon American introductions. You know, it's part of the Iberian what would you call it, complex of cultures. Um, and they have this tune that is played for all events to introduce events, to show uh, friendship and community at an event, and to show respect to one another. It's called Agur. Agur is Basque for hello and goodbye when people pass on a street and aren't going to talk. And it, it shows a kind of friendly respect to each other. So I just want to play this a little bit for you. And then we're going to do one brief dance thing, I hope, if you think we have time. Here it is. And then we maybe are going to eat this with lunch. I've talked about the crossing of America and the old world, new and old, if we're allowed to say that. I want to show that in music, too. So would we have eight people who'd volunteer to dance? Stand up, if you're willing. Stand up. One. Two. Anybody? We need eight. We need eight. Three. Four. That's all right. It's not hard to do. How many do we have now? One, two, three, four, five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, eight. Great. So this... This is, I know, this is like some weird Wyoming disease. Look at it, all female. One guy, he's, at least he's got a brain. Um, so, talk about so we're going to do a square dance briefly. This square dance, though, links elements of American and African music history. It's a square dance from North Carolina's Piedmont that was invented by African-American people for a tradition they call frolic. And it includes a very interesting element of African dance history and Appalachian, British Isles rooted dance history. Okay, so we need, has, who's ever square danced? Any of you? Okay, a lot. So we need a couple here. This is the band. Pretend I'm the band. So this is couple number one. Traditionally, the couples have the gentleman on the left and the lady on the right. When there's gender confusion in modernity, often people teach dances by saying the tallest person should be on the left. And then you kind of know how to operate. Oh, well, you fine. Stay over here. You just, you just, you just stay and be the guy. Okay. It won't really matter in this song. So there are going to be a number of calls. This I learned from a man named Joe Thompson, 
a wonderful African-American frolic fiddler, one of the last of his line of musicians. And Joe always called this dance the same way. So we've got, this is like couple number one, and then over here, kind of like this, is number two, and then number three is facing the band, and the last one is five. So here's what we're going to do. You have these commands in the dance. Another element of it that distinguishes it from Appalachian dance a lot is it is much simpler steps. And the foot motion is governed. You don't have to do it, but you can try. It's very much like what we'd call a polka. So that when you're dancing square dance, often Appalachian square dancers will just kind of walk in rhythm to the dance, right? Whatever the music is. But in a frolic dance, they would go one, uh, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. The whole time they're doing the dance, <laughs> wherever they're going. If they're swinging, <laughs> if they're walking around promenading. OK, so the first call is um, stand square, which means there you are. And what you would do to the music in this, actually, let's just play a little of the music. This is a tune also that came from Joe Thompson. And he called it either Ryro's House or Corn Liquor. He always <laughs> used two different names, which is a nice American name for the song, Corn Liquor. So the song goes about like this. So try to do that polka step to this rhythm. That's good. Now, so the next call that you would learn is, this is stand square. Great big eight means all hold hands. So great big eight. Now you're going to kind of dance. Now you're going to greet your partner. You can do whatever you want. You can kiss them on the cheek, shake their hands. Now you're going to greet your corner, who is the other person. Now you're going to do this. You're going to um, make a great big eight. Now you all around left. That means go counter, I mean clockwise. Yeah, you all around left. Yeah, you all around left. Now you're right by right. Oh, good job. Yeah, you're right by right. Yeah, you're right by right. And you stand square. Now here comes the hard one. Ooh, this is really bad. Reach out your right hand to your corner. Walk around the corner and back to your partner. Reach out your left hand to your partner. Go around your partner and back to your corner. Right hand again. That's called right hand around. This is easy, so we're going to do it like this. 16 times, 16 times, 16 times. Now you stand square. Yeah, you stand square. Now, couple number one's going to go all around the ring. Promenade inside the ring. Couple number one. Just go around that ring. Pretend you're going around town like a promenade, the two of you. Yeah, you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, together. Yeah, you say hello to everyone. When you get back home, the gentleman dumps his girl. It's bad history. And he goes to couple number two and takes the lady. And he goes on around the ring again. Yeah, you're all around the ring. Now go around the ring on the inside again. Boy, this is a bossy man. All around the ring. Now you say hello. Yeah, now you go to get the lady in couple number three. Now you go around the town, maybe take her on down, and you have a cup of coffee, go a movie, have a little piece of pie, eat a piece of pie made by Rhoda in North Dakota, have a big piece of pie. Now you go to couple number four. Yeah. There you go around the ring and you have a good time. Pretty soon you're going to get home and what you're going to find? You're going to find your beloved. So you get in the center of the ring. This is the part. No, no, just the gentleman. Just the gentleman. And you're going to try and apologize by dancing. No, not to them. To her. The big dance, big dance. Now you're all around a couple number one, and you have a good time, and you tell her that you're sorry. And here's the end of the song usually is. Hadn't been for corn liquor, corn liquor, corn liquor. Hadn't been for corn liquor, I'd have been fine. Hadn't been for corn liquor, corn liquor, corn liquor. Hadn't been for corn liquor, I'd have been fine.
normally that would be done with every couple would go around, you know, get to go around the inside and joke with the other couple. So you can see that it doesn't have high tech demands. It's not like, excuse me, birdie in a cage on an oyster shell in Thursday at, you know, it's not that kind of square dancing. So people really have a lot of spontaneous joking and interaction with each other. The thing in the center is such a clear reference to the West African dancing that would not be seen in a traditional Appalachian-based square dance where one person would go in and do a kind of a solo thing to whatever it was, right? And then I have added one thing that Joe never did, which is payback. At the end of the dance, we always have the females all go into the center and dance with each other and ignore the gentlemen. <laughs> so this is getting close to being ready, isn't it? One last thing I'll say about that. I brought corn chips, a traditional thing to eat with that. But I brought one chip that's unusual. It's corn. You see that? Lift up that bag uh, behind you. Not the corn chip one, the other, the unusual bag. And it says on it, olive. But in fact, the primary ingredient is corn. It's corn, 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 olive. Interesting though, of course, that's a food that couldn't have existed before the Colombian adventure because olive's old world and corn's new world. So this is a classic example of us combining these foods into something we take as totally normal. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's a localized version of guacamole without tomato. <coughs> Is that here in Gillette? You've seen that? Yeah, Where? In California. Oh, classic. John mentioned the Nouvelle Cuisine. This is a classic. She says it's a guacamole with no tomatoes, but with pomegranate seeds and bits of pear. Perfect. I will tell you, if you want to make a proper Nouvelle Cuisine meal, just drizzle some balsamic vinegar in pretty patterns and drop some pomegranate seeds on it. <laughs> and you got Nouvelle Cuisine. Now that's another whole topic we're not going at, what Nouvelle Cuisine meant in the history of European cookery. And then this kind of massive confusion of mixtures from all over the world without reference to the food histories of the place you're in. So that you get some kinds of things that are like strange artifacts, right? <laughs> of food because people are trying to be innovative and new in the world of cooking. Yes? You were talking about Basque cuisine. Can you give us some examples? Well, here's an interesting thing that came from America, too. The Aztecs didn't eat breakfast when they got up, historically. The central Mexican Valley peoples worked for a good chunk of time, and they ate a fairly substantial meal about 10, our idea of 10. They didn't have that clock, of course, but, you know, mid-morning. Then they didn't eat again till like, 1.32. What are we looking at? We are looking at the traditional dietary eating pattern of the Iberian Peninsula as influenced by their encounter with Nahua peoples. So that you eat a big meal. The Aztecs ate it because it was too hot in the middle of the day. They just stopped. And they had a gigantic meal between like 2 and 4, 1.30 and 3.30. So let's see the question though. Oh, bass, yes. So bass eat that same way. And traditionally, it takes a long, long time to eat a Basque meal because they take that time in the afternoon. There is shifting now in the Basque country to American schedules. There's huge confusion now because some people work the kind of schedule Americans do. But the majority of people still try to live on the old system so that shops, very commonly in the Basque country, are open from 9 to 1 and 4 to 8. And they're closed between 1 and 4 in the afternoon. You can't do business. It's a split shift day. And the meals are in courses, very traditionally, though Basque salad almost always includes a good one when people have really got the wherewithal to do it all. It includes olives, tuna, onion, it includes always olive oil, various kinds of greens. Egg is often in it, boiled egg. And then a second course, which is usually either um, a legume or a pasta. So it might be fideo, a little tiny noodle thing in tomato, or it might be a lentil dish with potatoes in it, very typical of the second course. A third course would often be some kind of animal product, usually fish in the Basque country, some kind of fish product, which is an unbelievable array of seafoods in Basque cooking, including various seafood stews. In North America, we don't see that. People here would associate Basque cooking with Lukanka sausage made from lamb, with um, garlic, with blue cheese, that kind of food, because most of the American bass live in interior Intermountain West areas, so they don't have access to good seafood. But in the Basque country, and oh my God, like, you know, squid in its sauce, uh, these kind of dishes are really central in Basque cuisine. So the Basque would be garlic a lot in their meals in, in Spain? 
Oh, yes. Garlic's not New World. Yeah. Right? Garlic was, was available to them. Yeah. And Basque people only recently have adopted corn. They put corn now in their salads, but until 30 years ago, corn was a food only to be given to animals. Humans did not eat corn. Anything else? Any other question? Oh, are you sure? I can't believe you don't have 100,000 questions. You're leaving out one important country. I'm leaving out a lot of important things. Uh-oh, what is it, the Netherlands? Yes, because you're talking about the Spanish and the Brits and, and uh, speaking about pepper. By the, the way, this man is Dutch. It was the Dutch that got the pepper, and they went the other direction. To Asia, yeah. And, yeah. So well, interesting. here's another interesting factor of that. The Dutch ruled northeastern Brazil for 19 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. For 19 years, they had actually booted the Portuguese out of a huge chunk that was Brazil. And so they, of course, were implicated and in all sorts were of food movement. Very complicit in the slave trade. Yeah. Or, I mean, they were the biggest slave yeah. trade. Are we done? Conversation, yes. Okay. But I'm, I'm Cut, cutting everyone off for the moment. And but the great thing is, is that um, you guys can stick around um, and have lunch with us. But um, just a segue from from this amazing presentation. Uh, I don't even know how to follow that up. So first, I'd love to give David our round. Thank you very much. A very engaging talk. Thank you. <laughs>